Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about Surface and the architecture of the library I I built. Um, if any of you guys have questions, uh, you can unmute yourself or type in the chat. Although I might not see the chat. Uh, I'm not completely sure how we're gonna go about this, but I guess we'll. There's a lot to go through, so we might as well just get to it. Um, when I think about the, the library, I don't really think of it as having an architecture. I think of it as, as having tools to do these things here. So the tools to make transactions, validate transactions, and then for users to recover their balance. And actually these two pieces are relatively um, small amount of the number of files in this library. Balance, Balance recovery, recovery takes a lot, lot of effort, effort to, to get, get all the different um, workflows that, that you, you might want and flexibility. Um, so so we, we can, I guess we, we can, can start, start by looking at the transaction implementation. So this is the transaction, uh, the main, main transaction type, type. There's the only one that exists now. now. I, still have to, I still have to write the Coinbase transaction type. This is the, um, this is the one we've got. So what I have is we've got inputs for legacy and Seraphis. We've got outputs. We've got the, the balance proof for so the balance proof covers Seraphis inputs and all the outputs. So these these two are balance proof, balance proofed. And then the all the proof all the proofs for membership. So legacy ring signature, this is just seal sag. And then we've got the griddle proofs for Seraphis and the composition proofs. And then we've got the, the the TX supplement, I call it. This guy contains the, the ephemeral pub keys. So these are just the transaction keys that we have now, pub keys. And then the TX extra, which is just a byte field. Um, yeah. And then, and then there's the semantic rules version that I added. So this rules version is meant to be used to um, just like to indicate rules about about the semantics of all this stuff that don't impact the, the structures used. So all the stuff stays the same and these just impact the rules. So we can we can go look at the rules that I have implemented uh, somewhere in here. So we've got component counts. Uh, so we've got so this this allows the separation between mockup and the real and like the main transaction version to be really like straightforward. So we have input output counts for config, and then uh, we've got reference or the rough set sizes. So the ring size controls and then also some configuration details about the surface uh, membership, membership proofs. So do you guys have any questions about how a transaction is built or constructed? Um, not now. I had one, I'm assuming you can't mix input like you can't have legacy and service at the same time is it like a no it's it's mixed so you can have both oh i missed that somehow. okay interesting oh so that's, that's, that's why you said a balance proof over those two you actually well the, okay i like to see this implementation that's pretty interesting okay well actually i mean the balance proof i, I meant the the range proofs are over the outputs and service inputs because with the way this with the surface cryptography you need to range proof the surface inputs um 
Right, and so it still works for the legacy inputs too, which is okay. Yeah, I've integrated all the legacy stuff, so we can actually go look at a the integrated integration unit test where I'm doing everything in here. So here's the integration unit test, uh, sending and receiving transactions. So we've got configuration stuff. We instantiate a, a, a mock ledger, ledger context. So I have to build a whole like, like this thing of the beast to, in order to do all the unit testing. And then I send the legacy amounts to the user. Or actually, no, these are, these are the base for the, uh, for the ring signatures. So we, we make users, make user keys. We make user addresses. Uh, we prepare uh, eNote stores. So eNote stores are just, is, is the core piece for balance recovery where all the, all the eNotes you own are recorded and tracked. And then, so I'll get to the input selector later. This is how you select inputs. It's like a, it's a interface wrapper um, for input selection. And then, so here we go, we send legacy amounts to the user. We send Seraphis amounts to the user. Uh, these, so these, these functions send, take the ledger context and just add, add a block. So this would be a, a legacy block and this would be a Seraphis block. Um, and then, and then, then here we, we have, have the, the user, user refresh their you know, you know, store. store. And so, so the balance, balance is now include both legacy and surface. And then we transfer funds. We transfer um, funds from both legacy and surface. So this is the six, which is, has to be mixed. So we transfer funds to the other user. Now then the user refreshes and has has the surface e-notes of this amount. And then he sends them back and then refresh and sends them back and forth like that. So yeah, it's mixed, mixed legacy and surface. Uh, let's see. So go back to the walkthrough. All right, so I was talking about making transactions. So, so with Seraphis, uh, the there are multiple ways to make transactions. So these, these are all the transaction builder pieces, or assembly pieces, or methods. Oh. Uh, so with Surface, my goal was more modularity. So there are many different paths into your transaction. So all, all the different paths kind of uh, coalesce down into the, the single transaction or the final transaction. So all of these methods point into this final method, which, go which is uh, this guy here. Or we just put up, put up and get into the transaction. So, so um, let's, let's see. So I can, yeah, well, we can talk about the, the transaction builders. So how do we, how do we aim ourselves into making a transaction? All right. So. The two, the two main building or the two are like, like uh, basic building blocks are input proposals and output proposals. So you just say, I'm going to propose to, to use some input for the transaction. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to propose an output. So what are the output details that I want to have? Um, and then you can use those to, to create a transaction proposal. All right, let, let me see here. So the transaction proposal contains, right, so that, okay, hold back up a little bit. The transaction proposal contains input proposals 
and payment proposals. So payment proposal precedes output proposals because a payment proposal contains um, contains explicitly the amount in the destination. So it, it doesn't actually contain the output or the e-note. It contains the the user address of of the amount where the amount is going to be sent. And then the private key of the e or the ephemeral private key, and the and some memo fields that are optionally attached to the payment proposal. So this is kind of a It's kind of like the, the starting point for sending money to someone. So you can send, give someone a payment proposal, please send me this amount to my destination. And then you can, you can convert a payment proposal to an output proposal. So this, this method here is where we convert payment into output proposal. And this is where all the trend, all the cryptography of assembling or, or constructing an e note is, is encapsulated. It is, it is creating this output proposal thing. So we have all this, all the, all the Jamtis cryptography is in, in here. Or the, the, the step that is created in the e note. So it's, so it's just it's a lot of cryptography. You could make, make the one-time one address. address. Here's the Here's view the tag, tag. Um, then click them out. Yeah, so, so the output proposal, proposal contains, contains the, the constructed, constructed you know, but also some, some um, useful, useful information uh, about, 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 about the output, output that we used, used Far down, down the line, line and, and then constructing things back. back. So, so we, we need, need the, the amount of the amount of lining factor, factor for uh, for the range proofs. So, so those, those are stored explicitly instead of as an um, uh, a commitment. Uh, so where was I? Right, we were talking about transaction builders. Tra here, transaction builder types. So we have an output proposal which is which originates as a payment proposal. And we have input proposals, which, which are, we can, we can see, see what's inside, inside that input proposal. It's, these, these, so this, so this, all this, all this information, information is, is like, like cash information, information about the email you, know, you want to spend. spend. This stuff, this, this struct should never be sent to someone else. It's just a convenience struct. Where you say where you specify the email you want to spend, so you have some recorded email with information about it, and then you convert it into an input proposal, so that it's it's con conveniently packaged for use during the transaction construction. So we have all the the private key, the 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 view key material. So this isn't the spend. This isn't the spend key doesn't have the spend key in it, but it has the, the view private key material. So this is all the like the address index stuff and the, the Diffie-Hellman um, exchange components. And then of course the amount blinding factor and the amount. And then the input proposal also, so this is a Seraphis input proposal. It contains the, the masks, which will be used to create the Eno image. So if we, we can look at a, uh, legacy input proposal. So this is this is what you would use to make a current, like an existing transaction or a current transaction. So you have the the e note, you have the key image that's going to go that it's going to actually go in the transaction. The the view private key, which is just conveniently cached. It's not like no deeper meaning to it being stored here. The amount and the blinding factor, and then the commitment mask, which will, which is used to make the pseudo output commitment. This this uh this needed for um, seal tags. So it's it's just analogous. It's very analogous the Seraphis input proposal to a legacy input proposal. 
Great. So we have input proposals, output proposals, and transaction proposals. So the transaction proposal contains all, all the inputs, inputs outputs, outputs B and uh, the memo. memo. So th this isn't this isn't the final memo. memo. This, this is the, the this is the these are the optional memo fields attached to the proposal itself, which will be um, you it added to from the payment proposals, which have their own memo optional memo fields. Um, so this is like this is something you would show to the user for details from the transaction proposal you'd show to the user when the user is saying maybe I want to make a transaction. You could generate many of these transaction proposals for different fee amounts, for example. And then the user selects a fee and then the TX proposal is used to um, is transformed into a partial transaction. So we go from transaction proposal into partial transaction. Because a transaction proposal contains explicit information about the amounts uh, of the inputs and outputs and the destinations. But the trans a partial transaction contains all the transit. It's like a transaction, except it's missing the Seraphis membership proofs. That's, that's the only thing that a partial transaction is missing. So we cache the information needed to make Seraphis membership proofs. And we also cache the, uh, the legacy ring signature ring members so that we can do, um, so we can validate a partial transaction, which, I'll, which is a, a fun thing that I'll mention later. So, so, th so this partial transaction is kind of the, in some, in some ways it's like the capstone of the Seraphis transaction building process because a partial transaction can be, you can chain transactions off of partial transactions. So you can make a chain of partial transactions where each partial transaction has cache information about how to make Seraphis membership proof, but you don't need to know the, the membership proof decoys when you make a partial transaction. So you can, you can make legacy input proposals that refer to service enos, which are, which you acquired from a partial transaction. And then you can spend those input proposals in a partial transaction. So you get this, you're able to do this chaining of partial transactions off chain. And, and you can be confident that, um, So long as the each each member of the chain can be added to the blockchain, so there's no like uh, key key image uh, duplication, um, then and the and the and the at the beginning of the chain, there's it's referencing something that actually exists on the on the blockchain on the ledger. Then you can be confident that the partial transaction off-chain sequence can be, you can make membership proofs for each of them and submit the partial transactions as full transactions. Um, right, so anyone have questions up to where we are now? Looks like we might have gotten a new attendee. Um, yes, I, I have a question, Cole. Um, regarding chaining, um, do you think it would be possible to have a feature like they have in Bitcoin that's um, replaced by fee? Um, you know, because if you have the, uh, you just need a, in your proposal to have the kind of the key image without saying, um, or yeah, the key image without saying, um, yeah, well, you we just have to, to have to know the the 
um, the addresses and then you can build the key image. So, but if you have this beforehand, uh, then you, if someone says, okay, I know that I'm expecting to receive something from a guy and then I can make a, a key image with this, this address and then uh, I can add this in another transaction expecting that this, um, yeah, that this will be collected by the miners in a later date. Does it make sense? Do, do you understand what I'm trying to say? I, I'm not completely following. <laughs> yeah, it was very confusing. Um, well. So where, where are you starting with this question? Where do you start? Yeah, so the thing is, if you are going to make a proposal, you just need to, to have the Oh, you, you have all this these fields here, but in the end, the most important is the is the address that you are sending to. So you cannot you cannot create a an output without knowing the inputs. So that that's the um, there's this thing called an input context. When we go to the Jamfit payment proposal, let me say go to the output proposal. One of the inputs is the input context. We added so this was this was uh, Kayaba Nerve's kind of contribution to this whole system is the input context. So we can go in here, um, input context. The input context is hashed into the sender receiver shared secret. So the Diffie Hellman, we have the Diffie Hellman key, and then that's hashed alongside the uh, ephemeral pub key and the input context. Okay. Uh, right. Um. So that so the input context is a hash of the inputs. Yeah, and but I, I'm I'm trying I'm trying to to understand when you say chaining. Um, you have to have the previous transaction, even if it's um, um, off chain. So, but but yeah. you need to have the full transaction with the full information. I'm I'm thinking yeah. that when you, you you say chaining, maybe you could have only the information. Um, I don't know the the most basic information, like the the key image that would be recorded in the chain, but not exactly um, many other things. Maybe the amount, yes, but uh, yes, yeah, I think of course you need the amount, but uh, not so many things. So then you can construct your own transaction without knowing much about the previous transaction. Um, well, you need to know the all of the outputs of the prior transaction in the chain, because those those go into the legacy input proposals, which. Hmm, let me see. So you're saying, okay, so if you just know the, you know, the key images, um, then when the prior transaction is, is sent into the chain, you won't know um, the, you won't know the real inputs. Or you you won't know uh, what you know it's the inputs to your proposal your transaction where they came from exactly because the because you won't see this partial transaction which has the explicit um, inputs so we have oh we have we have the ledger. And then this spawns a partial transaction. And then you want to chain off of this to make another partial transaction. And you want to avoid seeing the seeing which e notes from the ledger uh, are spent in this intermediate step. Is that what you're saying? So yeah. You just, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, because you, we are only looking at e-notes, and e-notes are just uh, 
basically the the key image and the the address. Um, so yeah. the the, re the reason I I talk about partial transactions is you can you can validate this thing. You can validate that all the proofs are correct and that there's a the, the funds you're actually spending in this transaction are actually connected to the ledger. Because if you without that proof, you're kind of just it, it depends on how your how your what your application is or how your how your system is um what are your constraints? Because in a mm -hmm. in a trustless protocol, you cannot assume that this transaction that you're chaining off of is actually related to the ledger in any way. Yes, I agree. Um, I was just trying to improve my understanding of chaining. <laughs> you're right, though. Uh, by the way, who is, the, who is this new person that joined? Who is, who is this somebody? Hey, this is an unknown user. They're squatting over here. I don't know who, okay, I've got the label now. There we go. So his question is, hash contact is a hash of the inputs. Um, here, I'll go look at the, where the input context is defined. If I can find it because it's somewhere in here. Maybe here. Mm. Nope. Here we go. It's in Chantus Eno Utils. We've got chant make Chantus input context and it, it takes the legacy input key images, serifus input key images and hashes them. And then for Coinbase transactions, it's just the block height. So that's the... Can you all hear me? Yep, I hear you. Oh, hi, okay. Sorry, I can give it a word for what... So yeah, just to, like, just to double check, the, the, the input context is just to make sure you know the input key images aren't uh like reused like the, the same set right well so the input context is used for the so-called burning bug that Kai Abner kind of highlight oh, okay. so we want to make sure that uh we want to make sure that the output one-time addresses of your transaction do not or so let's let's see so we want to we want to avoid someone looking at the ledger and then finding multiple e-notes with the same one-time address. Because if they find multiple of those, then only one of them can be spent, which creates a huge hassle for the balance recovery process because now you've got to track all these duplicates. And so I'll show you what happens with the... <clears throat> The legacy balance recovery when you got to deal with that crap. Let's see. Here. So here's the the you know store mockup that I have. All of this, All this stuff, stuff here here. Or no, or this, no this guy this here, guy here is, is an intermediate, intermediate hash tracking, tracking thing, thing that that keeps keep track, track of duplicates, duplicates for like like these one time accesses. And this, and this thing, thing makes, makes a huge, huge amount, amount of complexity, complexity in, in the balance, balance recovery, recovery process. process. So, so it's, it's, it's good, good to get, get, get rid of that. But that's, that's what the, that, that, so the input context, context solves that problem by making sure that, that when you're looking for any you notes, you first compute, compute the input context, context for a transaction that you're looking, looking at, at, and then, then you try, try to recover the, the or try to uh, uh, decrypt the, the output, output he knows. And since input contexts context are always unique on the chain, um, the fact that they're hashed into the outputs means that you will never encounter it. You will never recover an e note that has a duplicate one time address. There might exist on the chain duplicates, but only if they are not constructed using the, the standard 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, like dupe, So the input context can never be duplicated, right? So, you, and then the actual like spend output is calculated. It's not on chain. It's calculated with as the input context as a like a function of that. Right? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you send. You, you use this when, when you're constructing an email, email. Um, locally, locally for your transactions. transaction. You just have it in there. there. Then, then Q, Q gets, gets hash hat and everything else. Here, here. Um, so one, so one, one thing, one that, thing can that can happen is, is you, are, you are talking to a third party in order to scan. Then the the third party could collaborate um, with someone who's trying to make you find duplicates, and then give you a fake input context or fake information to construct an input context. Um, but that's, 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 you can't really solve that problem. Okay. Looks like we lost Justin. Um, okay. um Anyways, I'll message so him over IRC, but he's recording. So I don't know. Do we want to pause or I'll just hit the record button. And then, yeah, okay. I don't know. Maybe that'll work. So we've already gone through four or half an hour, and we we've made a little bit of progress. Um, let's see here. So, where should we go next? We've got the transaction builder. We were talking about. We were talking about. Um, oh, I'm sorry to pick up, but Justin just messaged me. He's still recording something now, so uh, oh, good. don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so we were talking about the partial transaction, transaction chaining. Where should we go next? <laughs> There's so much stuff here. Let's see. Uh, are there any like areas that that you guys think I should look into at this point, or start going towards? Like Renee, what do you think? Because this is you're like the main target here. I'm seeing. Uh, he's is he working on wallet stuff, or is I'm just curious why he would. Yeah, he's doing the Seraphis migration stuff, or he's leading that work group. I need to follow this for man. There's so much. All right. Um, so I'm curious about the bend stuff. Is are you switching to a the binning proposal? And then I guess the other one is are you doing a deterministic input selection or, or how is that how is the input selection changing and that kind of thing? It looks like I'm seeing bend, so I'm assuming that is that what it is discussing? Okay, so the bins are for uh, the reference set, so that how you select uh, decoys. So we've got the bin reference set here. Um, so what we've got is, so the bins are like, so we've got the, the ledger, it looks like this, and then you select some You select some enotes from this part and then from over here too, and then from over here, over here, oops. Over here. I mean, this was a bidding proposal that was in that white paper then, right? Basically is what you're saying? Uh, The white paper. No, there was a white paper about bidding. I, I, th um, I don't think, I don't think there was anything where it was, so it's multi, these are each bin is selected from the the selection distribution, and then within the bin are multiple. Is a uniform distribution. So it's kind of oh. like a combination of all the proposals that have been made. Right, because that proposal was you select immediate nearby neighbors, but this is slightly different. This is a larger bin, and then you select. Okay, interesting. 
Right. So all all the bin stuff is deterministic, or all the bin members and so on are deterministic. So we have uh, a seed value. This is just some entropy that is derived from the um, the input, I believe, that you're you're referencing. And then we have bin loci, which are this. So it's the center of each bin is recorded as an offset. Uh, just the same, same way we do now record with offsets. And then we have, so the bin rotation factor, so we we generate bins randomly around each bin center, bin, bin locus, and then we use the bin rotation factor to rotate all the bins by a fixed amount so that in the, the bin that contains the real one, one of the references, one of the bin members lands on the real reference. Oh, so that's because the uniform distribution wouldn't just arbitrarily. Okay, I got you. And so that's to, to fudge that a little bit. But then, okay, is, is that what that's doing there, right? Oh, man, yeah. that's... <laughs> okay, that's gonna... I'm sorry, this is the kind of thing I think about because it's going to take a while to... Okay, I think that'll work, but okay. Yeah. So you, you random... So when you're creating a, a reference, print set, you randomly select one of the uniformly generated members with, from within the bin that contains the real reference. You randomly select one, and then you say that you just compute the subtract that that bin member's position from the real member's position, and that's your rotation factor. But that's kind of getting in the weeds, so. Yeah, sorry, but yeah, this is because uh, I've read through Jamtis to to catch up on what was changing about that portion of it. Like I've been trying to keep up with a lot of this stuff because it keeps changing. But okay, um, yeah, no, that's that's fine. Because because I guess the the problem that you had here was the ring size was gonna be so much bigger, the encoding size in the chain was gonna be so much bigger. So then you had to like right. Um. So can you talk about? I, I know you've had this. Do you have a target number of uh, decoy members in mind now? Uh, well, I was right now. I'm working with um, I guess it doesn't say it here. It's a hundred and twenty-eight in many members. Right, that's that's a massive bump from what we have now, really statistically. I would think. And then, well, if we use the bulletproofs plus plus, we might be able to manage 256 because bulletproofs plus plus is um, even more efficient than bulletproofs <laughs> plus. But we we don't have any we don't have any code for that. So yeah, we don't have. Has anybody reviewed? Does that like we gotta review? The, there's like a lot of steps in that. But I think Justin was planning to um, to to ask to uh, request a quote from a uh, cipher trait track wait what uh, not cipher trace I don't know. <laughs> whatever their the company is called cipher tech um, to do a review and proof of concept but that hasn't happened yet okay so you had another question that I forgot what it was has been i i think you answered but maybe it wasn't clear if anybody watches this video because it, it had to deal with i saw bend in there and i wasn't sure if it in the end if the, i'm sorry if is anyone end. making questions because i can't hear if uh, if the questions are being made i can hear your answers but i can cannot hear the questions oh i mean so you can you can hear me but he i mean co you can hear me though obviously because you're responding so i don't Man. Uh, Dangerous. Are you not able to hear VT nerd? Nope. Uh, oh, hold on. I'm getting another message from Justin. Maybe he he knows what's going on because I don't. I have no idea how to solve that one. Justin said, uh, maybe Justin can hear all three of us, so maybe RB Runner needs to reload to to get my stream or something. Um, that would be dangerous. Or dangerous, right? Sorry, right. Um, I, yeah. 
Uh, I don't oh. know that I, had, I guess I was just curious on the proposal because I'd seen a lot of the proposals, but I, had, I didn't know where the the selection algorithm because um, I knew we discussed it was probably going to have to change because it's of the bigger ring sizes and everything else. I, I didn't know. It's interesting that the proposal is like you said. Yeah. Um, oh. Co, you need to ask Dangerous to reload because he can't. I just asked him to reload, but he can't hear me. So you have to tell. <laughs> Dangerous, you should reload your reload your. <laughs> Thank you, Justin, for um, yeah, we're we're two illogical idiots over here. I'm just talking to myself or to just to Co. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have any other comments on that unless someone else did. I'm looking through your. I, I've actually gone through a couple of your code bases because I was curious about what was going on there and how that was going to have to integrate and how I assume I got to look up to see what uh, RB runners and I'm curious because then there's like the whole angle of updating every hardware wallet and then uh, like the whole downstream thing as well. So um, I'm sure that's what Renee is working on, but I was looking through your, I've looked at your code base kind of. Um, so this is very specific. How much do you reference it looked like for the most part you were trying to make it a standalone library, meaning that it didn't reference outside outside Monero stuff too much. Is that the case, or am I mistaken? Yeah, I I basically don't reference anything. The only thing I really reference is in the legacy, um, somewhere in the legacy oh, stuff. Oh, Ring CT you just mentioned, you just referenced. Like I, can I see do reference. Right. I do reference CL SAG, but um, the only thing I really reference is sub address index for the legacy stuff. So I re implemented all the legacy stuff in order to get it, get the interface right. to work with the pattern that I use it using. And again, for anyone that watches the stream later, I'm curious because this has to deal with how easy it is to import into other code bases. Uh, our current implementation is kind of rough because you end up having to drag in a lot of stuff especially if you want wallets who you've ended up having to drag in everything. So um, yeah, so I, I basically re-implemented a lot of the legacy stuff in order to have legacy balance recovery that follows the same pattern. So we can reuse the same uh, balance recovery algorithm that I built. So this thing is actually a beast. This thing is the biggest beast in the whole, the whole library is this function here or this function. So in this function, we we're doing this function handles all of the the balance recovery. That's like the 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 call you make to do balance recovery. And this call wraps an algorithm that that um, that handles. So the, the the purpose of this algorithm is to handle reorgs that occur while you are sc scanning. So I made it I made it able to handle reorgs that happen while you are scanning, which was kind of a pain. And <laughs> there's a lot of unit tests to make sure it actually works. Um, but I was able to get legacy balance recovery to work a lot to work with this algorithm. Uh, in addition to Seraphis balance recovery. And so I had to I had to implement a lot of legacy stuff in order to accomplish that. Scanning needles, let's see, in here. There is, yeah. This, this algorithm is gonna be difficult to validate, but there's a lot of stuff in here that's gonna take a long time to validate. So, should I talk about the uh, the architecture of the scanning algorithm, or what? What do you guys want me to talk about next? So we've got we can go back to the walkthrough notes. I, I suppose we should we should look at validating transactions first, because that's actually the most important piece of the puzzle. So for transaction validation, I built a centralized um, procedure for it. So we have this transaction base where you, when you want to make a new transaction type, you go to this file and you add some 
So we have some template stuff that uh, you have to implement. And here is the transaction validation function implementation. So I have specific uh, call point or call in points that you have to implement. So you have to implement each of these uh, when you when you create a new transaction type. Uh, and then you don't you don't have to implement this because it already exists. But by centralizing all the validation in this function, I think it makes it a lot easier to understand when a transaction is actually being validated. Because right now we have it's kind of like strewn across this code base, these calls to like check semantic simple or whatever that function is called in all kinds of arbitrary places. It's very confusing. So I, I have this more organized approach to validation. So when you have a transaction implemented, you implement all of the validation functions for this transaction type. And then so for example, for the semantics, you go in here and say, we're going to validate the semantics of the transaction. So it has all the all the actual validation functions that that know about what the what the semantics should be that you call uh, to validate. And so now if you want to validate whether or not the transaction is validating things correctly, you have you just look here at all the rules that are being checked for semantics, for the linking tags, I mean, the key, either key images, I should probably just rename, rename this to key images, to balance proof, to the input proofs, and to everything that's batchable about validation. So that includes um, range, range proofs and, I don't know why this is here, surface membership proofs. Oh, we need the input images. All oh, right, we need the input images for that because we're doing whatever. Anyway, and then we batch verify with this this guy here. So this is the multi exponential multi exponentiation builder that I created in order to do batch verification efficiently. So this is the most, more or less, the most efficient you can get with batch verification. Shoving everything into one multi exponentiation, multi exponentiation, and then eva evaluating it and checking if it uh, is correct. So this is the this is what you see from the transaction point of view is calls into functions that are actually doing the validation, and these are all stored in. TX validators, which is one fun one one file that has all the validators in it. So now, if you want to look at <clears throat> the rules being validated, here we've got component counts. We have a component conf component count configuration object that gets passed in, which we we which we got from the. Um, the semantic rules version of the transaction we're validating. And then we can just check all the different things that we expect about transaction about component counts in the transaction. And so on and so forth for all the other pieces that we have to validate. So we see transaction validation only takes up a couple a couple files <laughs> compared to everything else. It's actually one of the easiest things to do when you're making a library like this. So what does everyone think about that, I guess? So does that SP transaction squash V1, that, that struct, does that contain everything you need to validate it? So like no requests in between? Oh, right. That's right. I forgot about that. We've got Validation context. This is the wrapper function or the wrapper class that you can use to call into your ledger or whatever. 
to ask about key images and get the reference set proof elements. So this guy is very convenient because we can do something like wrap the mock ledger context, and then it just calls into the mock ledger and you don't have to do anything else in order to mock up transaction validation with your mock ledger. And then we can also do something even cooler than that, which is wrap the mock ledger context in addition to cached values for the legacy reference set proof elements. We just cache the legacy reference set proof elements. And then when you validate a partial transaction, wait, yeah. Validate a partial transaction, which must contain the legacy legacy seal or legacy ring signatures. Let's see if I can find it. Mm. Check semantics for the partial transaction. So we have a partial transaction. We want to validate it against some semantic rules version. We create a mock ledger context in the in the semantic validator. We generate mock membership proofs for the for this trans, partial transaction. So we just fake membership proofs. And we cache the legacy ring signature ring members in the in the validation context and then you can you can convert the partial transaction into a full transaction and then validate it just with this call here. And that, val that fully validates your partial transaction as if it was a real transaction, just using uh, fake membership proofs. This is, this is the, the validate transaction function call. So I think this is pretty cool. I was pretty happy to figure this, out, to figure this one out. Uh, yeah, I kind of like that better than <laughs> current core of, <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what to call it. It's just a mess is what it is. So like the uh, a normal, if, and once it would get deployed, that would just, I don't know, do requests to the LMDB or whatever. So you'd, you'd have, you, yeah. could, you, you could implement this thing however you want, or or derive from right. however you want, as long as your functions do this. And then in, it, cool. in the validators, we've got your transaction validation context is just a, whatever, a, a low cost uh, reference wrapper that vir virtual dispatches down to your, whatever your implementation to, is to get the ring members for CLSAG. And then you verify your CLSAG like that. So I don't I don't care how this is implemented as long as it gives you gives you what you need. And that's kind of the the purpose of these. I have a lot of these kind of reference wrapper type things in this library. Is I needed dependency injection, so I just said okay, I'm going to have an algorithm wrap uh, interface or whatever for the the algorithm that I'm that I have in mind, and then you can implement it however you want. We've got that for validation. We've got that for input selection. We've got an input selector here. Just try select an input. I don't know how you implemented this, but uh, we, we've got fee calculator. We've got uh, whatever this is. This is kind of ugly, but yeah. Anyway. Yeah, really nice go. Yeah, I'll definitely use this to build my project of the wallet. But then uh, I don't know yet how we will store this on the blockchain. Because the wallet will be, uh, I will use all your this interfaces or classes or basically everything you created. But then, how to store this actually in a blockchain or in a, in a this yeah, this LMDB stuff? Then I think will be another thing. Well, I don't know how to answer that. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, just just thinking thinking loud. 
That's really, really awesome, your work. Oh, well, thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, Renee, did you, ha you said you had a lot of questions, so maybe you should bring out some of your questions. Oh, can he hear you? What was? He's in the chat. Oh, too early, he says. Okay. Um, let's see. We can. So that was that was transaction validation, which I wanted to go through. Did any? Are there any other questions before I move on to balance recovery? So kind of a yeah, just to reiterate. So you start the partial transaction contains what would be like references to other transactions or other e notes on the ledger, right? And then it kind of during the validation process, it turns it from a partial transaction into a full transaction. Is that correct to say? So the partial transaction contains everything in a transaction that you would normally find, plus but or but it does not have the Seraphis membership proofs. So the membership proof says this input image, which is like a a representation of the e note you're spending, corresponds to an e note that exists in the ledger. So it's a member of the ledger. So we do not prove that in the partial transaction. Instead, we just explicitly say which ones are our inputs. These are our inputs here input e notes. Okay, so this is kind of partial transaction is just for building transactions, it's not for validating. So so the partial transaction is a step along the way to a transaction, but a partial transaction can be chained off of you can make another partial transaction using it. So you could you could send a partial transaction into an off-chain ledger context or ledger or whatever uh, database and then you can do balance recovery off of the off-chain database to recover off-chain e-notes and then you can use the, the the transaction builder interface to pull those pull those e-notes out of your e-note store as in as inputs to a new partial transaction and that's how you do chaining and then when so we but in order for partial transactions to be useful in a in a in a transaction chaining environment where maybe you have some protocol that uses transaction chaining and you need to validate that all your all the pieces are correct, you need to validate the partial transaction rigorously. And so I built a just a, a validator for that. A validator for the partial transaction. It converts it into a full transaction using mockups for the the Seraphis membership proof. Th that way, you know, is so long as you are able to make, or so long as the the inputs actually exist in the ledger, then if you make membership proofs for those, you will have a legitimate transaction because you know that the transaction can be validated against all the full rule set that you expect. Nice. Can you comment a bit how you make the moot, a moot sig transaction? So you first have to have multiple partial transactions with your partners, and then in the end you add the membership proof. It's uh, for how, multi sig. Yeah, for moot sig. How how can you just uh, tell briefly how it's uh, constructed? Multi sig. Here we go. Is multi sig. Multi sig builder types is here. Multi sig builder types. So multi-sig is does not involve well it actually does involve partial transactions. So in multi-sig your goal is to make a partial transaction. And then the partial transaction can be locally upgraded to a full transaction by any member of the group. So with a with multi-sig you make a transaction proposal which contains the outputs and the inputs 
um, like, like you normally find in a transaction proposal. And then when you're validating the transaction proposal, you validate that the input proposals um, are actually owned by your multi-sig account. And then, but it also contains multi-sig proof proposals, proposals to make multi-sig proofs. And then you use these, uh, these, these multi-sig proposal pr proof proposals to do the multi-sig proofing to, to, uh, so you, um, You do the 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 so-called multi-sig signing ceremony in order to sign the 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 trans uh, the proofs, but with Seraphis you only have to do multi-sig for the composition proof, not for the membership proof. So multi-sig with CLSEG you have to do the whole thing, but with Seraphis you only have to do the composition proof. So that when you are done with the signing ceremony and you've created you've created complete surface composition proofs, then the, the end result can be combined into a partial transaction, uh, which can be, you can then make the membership proof for at a later date or whenever you need it. And so the advantage there is you can make the membership proof um, right before you submit a transaction, instead of needing to select the, the, the input or the ring members, the decoys, when you create the initial multi-sig transaction proposal, so that whoever, whichever group member proposes to make a multi-sig transaction. And that way you, you remove some timing information about uh, when the transaction proposal was created. Uh, does that answer your question or not? Yes, nice. Mm -hmm, thanks. Okay. So, um, just, okay, just uh, another question. So, in this um, composition proof mood sig proposal, so there inside this uh, structure, you probably have then multiple input proposals inside of this mood sig, right? Uh, these, well, it's a vector of proposals, so all the inputs you want to sign. Um, yeah, but this this struct, this vector of Mutsig stuff, it's uh, it, oh, okay. It's uh, all maybe all the ceremony stuff. Uh, okay, yeah, you have the signature notes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Um, so one thing with these multi-sigs is you you define this so-called multi-sig signer set filter. And this, um, so you specify a subset of your multi-sig group who you want to be involved in this multi-sig transaction proposal. And then every, every permutation of members of size N, of size M in this filter are used to um, make separate transaction or signing attempts. So, uh, so that kind of optimistically, the, the first permutation that successfully completes a transaction can submit it. That's, a, that's kind of a, a detail that makes everything, the whole thing quite complicated, but Anyway, I think we should move on to balance recovery. Let's see here. So enote scanning, and we have this guy here. So this is, the process for doing this is kind of complicated. Um, I'll, I'll go through like the the things the main things that are actually happening in this function. So this function is so for balance recovery, the overall picture is you so you initiate balance or this you call this function and it asks your 
eNote Store updater wrapper, which is going to be in charge of updating your eNote Store with all the all the stuff you find during scanning. You ask you ask this guy where you want to start scanning, and then you and then you do some some stuff to figure out what what the actual beginning bl block should be. So you just to make sure that you are uh, you coordinate with the refresh height um, the the refresh height of your you know store and then and then you just start you you start scanning from this initial height and so when you're looking at this and you see all these contiguity stuff this is these these are just used to make sure that or to figure out if you have encountered a reorg while you are in the middle of scanning. And that's um, and the and the alignment is used to find out where uh, where your scanning has diverged from what the eNote store knows about. So your eNote store has has scanned up some has scanned through some chain and then it's possible that at some point the act the the current uh canonical chain exists as a fork off of your of the, of the chain you scan so the chain you scanned had reorged after you last scanned so to drop some blocks and branch off into a new chain and so the alignment marker figures out is, is used to figure out um, that divergence point so that you can update your eNote store starting at the position where um, you've, you've, at the first new block that you haven't encountered yet. But the overall picture for scanning is to, to scan in chunks. So you scan, you scan a chunk of eNotes, and then you scan the next chunk of eNotes, and you expect that each chunk is aligned with the previous chunk. And if a chunk is not aligned with the previous chunk, then then you've reorged, and you have to back up and re and re restart uh, or redo some of your chunks. So breaking it into chunks like this, my goal it was to to facilitate uh, asynchronous scanning. So the creation of chunks is the expensive piece of scanning because that's the piece that um, creates the Diffie-Hellman exchange. To create to to scan a chunk, you you create Diffie-Hellman exchanges with every E note referenced in the chunk. So it's a chunk of blocks, and with, for every transaction in the in those blocks. You do the Diffie-Hellman exchange in order to. Um, it's the first layer of scanning of the scanning process. Then it's the most expensive layer because that's the that's where you filter out. Um, you filter out enotes that are probably not your enotes, or, or no, you filter out enotes that are definitely not your enotes and leave behind some that. Um, are candidates, um, candidate-owned enotes, I guess. And so when, when you get back a chunk that has been uh, view scanned or whatever, then you you further process that chunk local or um, in the um, process chunk, let's see. I can remember. <laughs> so you get you get a chunk, and then you process the chunk. So right, you get there's getting chunks and processing chunks. So you get chunks from the scan process, which is obtained from the scanning context, and then your. Um, let me see. And then your. All right, your eNote store updater processes the chunk after that. So it's a 
So a chunk contains, let's see, we, we can actually look at a chunk here. Um, is it di very different from what's done uh, currently uh, from scanning one-time addresses? Uh, is it done in chunks too? Um, I don't remember. You'd have to ask Justin, Jay Berman. It's, uh, I don't think there's much in the, in the way of reorg handling in the current scanning process. I'm not super familiar with it, how it works, honestly, but it's a lot, it's a lot simpler and, uh, doesn't do any reorg handling. So if there's a reorg that happens during scanning, uh, who knows what happens. Okay. I'm not familiar either. <laughs> right. Anyway, so, uh, a, a, a chunk contains <clears throat> information about the chunk, so block IDs, block heights. It contains basic records about, so the, the, these basic records are created from the initial view scanning step of when you're scanning. So, so it's a variant because it contains both um, legacy and Seraphis basic records. Um, And so when you, so a basic, so we can actually look at it more closely at what a basic record contains. Here's a legacy. So these are actually um, contextual records. So a contextual record is a record in addition to context about where the record came from. Uh, and this is how we, this is how I pipe information about, um, the context of things in, through the scanning process. We can look at this origin context here. The, the origin of an e-note, its context includes the its the block height, block timestamp, TXID, the the e-note, the index of the e-note in the ledger, and its uh, origin status. So this is kind of a the status thing kind of differentiates uh, enos that you found from off-chain, from the transaction pool, and on-chain. And there's a, the same thing for contextual or for key image sets. So um, contextual key images just contain a spent context or are attached to a spent context, uh, which includes where the key image was uh, was found. So block height, block timestamp, TXID, and the spent status, which 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 you can up to so you update this um so so a, a full enote record, you can look at a full enote record, or full contextual enote record contains both the, the record of the enote, the origin of the enote, and also its spent context. And you can up so you update this spent context whenever you've discovered that your enote is spent. Um, in the scanning process, we get we get basic records which contain the context of the basic records. We also get contextual key images from that chunk. So Key, key images, so, so in Seraphis, these are key images from transactions. So in the in the chunk range, we have a chunk of blocks. We, we scan all the transactions using the view key for legacy or the find received key for Seraphis. And then for all the transactions that might contain enotes that we own, uh, in Seraphis, or so this is so for services for service specifically all you know all transactions we that you make will contain a self send type of output so in most cases this is a change output but in some cases it will be a dummy output but it's an output owned by you 
so that you, you can always find transactions that you have spent or have, that you have constructed. And what this allows you to do is identify Um, okay, it's so complicated. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> it allows you to identify, um, so I should back up a little bit, sorry. So with this, in the surface scanning process, the, the first step, the find receive step, you make a Diffie-Hellman exchange with the, with the, uh, with the eNote ephemeral public key of the eNote you are scanning. And then you do you create you compute the view tag. If the view tag is a match, then that eno is can is is stored in a basic eno record. So this is this is a candidate eno that you might own. So it's recorded in a basic eno record as a candidate. You also in Seraphis decrypt the use the use the the sender receiver secret to decrypt the encrypted address tag that's associated with the e note. And um, after, so after that's been decrypted, it can be cheaply um, deciphered to find the address index inside the, the address tag. And also check the Mac attached to the address tag. So that lets you cheap after the find receive step step has has decrypted the encrypted address tag tag. You can cheaply decipher the address tag in a further step to uh, figure out if you own the e note with high probability. So the second step after that is very cheap. So that the so that the um, the bulk of computation in the scanning process is done at the basic record level. And so, so the, the scanning chunk that you get back from a ledger will, con in, for surface scanning, it will contain basic records for all of the view tag matches that you, your scanning step has, um, or your, your find received a scanning step has found or has has discovered, and among among that set will be will contain a all of the e, e notes you have received from other people, and also all of the self send e notes you have you have sent yourself as uh, in transactions that you have constructed. So. Since all of the transaction transactions you have constructed are represented in this this basic records set, you can you only need to also record the you don't need all of the key images from the uh, from that chunk. You only need key images from view from transactions with view tag matches because all of the enos, all of the key images of your of the enos you own, will be present in transactions that contain self send enos, and all self send enos will be members of the basic records list. So that's it's kind of a complicated way of saying that this, of of justifying that this does not contain all of the key images, for Seraphis scanning, for legacy scanning. Um, legacy only scanning, uh, it, it will contain all of the key images because in legacy scanning, you cannot know in advance, or you cannot know at the, at the, um, with the view key, at the view key scanning step, whether or not, or which, which key images you need to look at, at when you, uh, when you're at the spend key scanning level, the next level down. So in legacy scanning, this is these are the results of view key scanning your uh, legacy e notes. Um, right. So that that's what a chunk is. It contains the the first step of scanning with 
key images and the con context of all the stuff you scanned and the key images are is piped through through the into the chunk um, for use locally. So the production of chunks can uh, is something that should occur atomically uh, at the using a view of the ledger because you're looking directly at enotes in the ledger directly at blocks and enotes in the ledger and scanning but then you get so you get you can get chunks from the ledger that you you process after the after you get the chunks so you get a chunk and then you you further process it using your you know store up here um, to identify enotes within the ch within uh, within this chunk that you actually own, and also uh, you can look up look through the key images stored here to find key images that are um, key images of enotes that you own. And in Seraphis, you uh, your your view balance key is able to create key images so the uh in surface there's only one main scanning process uh, where the where the process chunk is able to create key images and then check key images um, in legacy scanning however the process chunk might not be able to uh compute key images if it's a view only if if you only if your local scanner is also view only so your your trunk maker and your trunk processor are both view only um then you might not be able to look do key image lookups you in that in that workflow you have to import key images and then and then do do like a funky rescan or re 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 request chunks, con, uh, but containing only legacy key images, in order to uh, like recover that information after the fact. So you do a an intermediate scan where you collect, uh, you do you view scan the, the all the chunks using process chunk, and then you do a a second pass after you've imported key images in order to look up um, look up the content or look up the which key images actually appeared in the blockchain and then match them against your imported key images um, so in the scanning process you you let's see so we can look at the ledger the ledger um, ledger scanning process here. So ledger scanning is a is a loop where you get you get chunks from the chain in a loop, and then you you check the you check the you check the chunk alignment whether it's aligned with the previous chunk that you got. And then you process the chunk, uh, just the same what I was talking about. And then you, so you iteratively do that um, while 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 keeping track of uh, alignment, all this alignment crap. But when you're doing ledger scanning, the very last chunk that's emitted by the get chunk request is a is a specially designed chunk that indicates it's the last chunk. So it's like, um, however, I have it here. When the end height, right, so when the, ch when the chunk range is zero, then then you've reached the end of your, you've, you've, you've found the final chunk. And then, yeah, and then you're done. So you, you, you get, so, so right, what, what I was, what I mentioned before is, this inside this scan process thing this is a this is a wrapper around around an you know scanning 
uh, context where so it's like this so it's an RAII wrapper around an enote scanning context where when the process begins when it's constructed you you tell the scan context to begin scanning from height and then so so then at each um each each time you request a chunk it forwards that to the enote scanning context, which is encapsulated here. And then at the end of the, when this, the scanning process is over, it, it terminate, it requ requests the scan context to terminate scanning. So this scanning context can internally, after it's been told that to begin scanning, it can internally um, get chunks asynchronously if it wants to. So that was like the whole goal of this, of this, um, these wrappers and this, and so on, is, is to be able to tell the you know scanning context when you've started a scanning process, and that, and that which allows this context to internally collect chunks uh, in whatever way it wants, so long as um, when you call get get chunk, it returns whatever chunk comes after the last chunk you requested. So it's, as long as it synchronously uh, does these on ch or get chunk uh, calls. Uh, yeah. So then, so we're, we're down back in the main function, which does scanning. So it, it, it contains a big loop, a big while loop that will continue so it, it only loops whenever there is some kind of um whenever there's a reorg in the middle of scanning so it, you you call into um the process process ledger so this is the this is where actual all the actual scanning occurs after you start the um right after so this is where all the scanning all the scanning occurs in here and then if this fails then you have to handle that by either re redoing the either redoing the loop or um in some cases you save the results so if, if it's a if, it, if you need to partially scan then you can save the intermediate results um before continuing. If it's a if you need a full scan, then you continue immediately. So, but if it does succeed, if the scan status is done, then you just record the record the results here. You uh by, by telling the eNote store updater to end the chunk handling session. So this this eNote store updater is is stateful. On the inside, it so this is this is what you you call against when you want to process a chunk. So it it's you send chunks into this thing, and then when you're done sending chunks in, you call end end session with some information about um, alignment, which you've been keeping track of through the scan process. This is an in out variable here into this the the ledger scanning main thing. Um, and that, that and that uh, kind of hand, handles it's it, it updates its inner internal state to to uh, to use all of the the cached inter, uh, chunk handled chunks. Which are cached inside the updater um, to update the you know store itself, or I mean there are you could do other things, but that's the strategy I go I'm going with. And then, well, if if this loops again, then up here before you scan, you you start the chunk handling session again on the updater, and then internally in here you're you're calling process chunk on each chunk. And then, and then you end the chunk handling session. 
and then and then you're done. You just quit immediately after after you're done, after you've handled the last the last pass through. So we can go and look at the what the you know what what the mock you know store updater is doing internally. Oh God, let's see. Here here's the leg here's the the mock-up for Seraphis um, Enote Store updaters. So it caches the the private keys needed for processing chunks. Um, the Jamtis private keys for caching for processing chunks. When you start a chunk handling session, you just clear your in, your internal caches, and then when you process a chunk, so you get your chunk rec your chunk basic records and your chunk contextual key images. And then you you do the actual process, you forward it to the actual um, chunk processing function with all your, um, all the details about how to, or all the private keys and then the chunk stuff and then the cache outputs you want to update. These are all in out variables here. And you also give it a callback to your eNote store to for for checking if a key image exists in the eNote store. So we can go look at this guy here. So this is the Seraphis process chunk function. Um, oh, it, there's some comments here. Let's see. Uh, someone says it does have a reorg handler today too in the scanning process. Something about sweeping. Okay, right. well that's interesting. In any case, uh, process chunk. So we've got a chunk of basic records, surface records, and contextual key images, which should which should line up with. Um, so. This is a map against transaction ID, I think. And so all every transaction ID in here should be should have a member in this list. But I don't think I actually check that. Doesn't look like it. Let's see. No, I don't check that. But anyway, so this is a map of 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 uh, basic records against transaction ID. And this is a list of key images, key image sets from each transaction that was, that we want to look, examine in this process trunk function. And these should line up with these transaction IDs. So the process here is, um, first we check if, uh, so we we check the right we can we check the key image we check the key images of this chunk we check check this chunk's key images to see if any of those match key images of Enos that we already know we own so these are all key images in the In, which we can query from via the callback, which if you recall was attached to the eNote store. So this is a callback to the eNote store. Or if, if the key image exists in in the in-out variable here, which which is the cached um, cached full eNote re records. Um, that we we found in previous chunks. So we we check the eNote store and previous chunks. If uh, if a key image in this chunk um, is is spending an eNote that we previously found, and then we save all the transaction IDs of transactions in this chunk that contain key images that are known to be spent. Um, 
And the second, so the second step is to actually do a normal scan of all the basic records or a, a normal um, full view scan of all the basic records. So th this this process is very cheap because we're only we're not computing our, our we're first filtering out all of the and we're first doing the um, the address tag decipher step, which is very cheap. So it filters out the vast majority of enotes in the enote the basic records map that are, we don't actually own. Um, so we 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 go through all of the basic records. It's just a uh, we un unravel the the map. Um, and try to upgrade each basic record into a full record. And then we also, if, if we own this record, then we also save its transaction ID. Um, because this trend, if we, let's see, we want to check if this transaction Oh, we, we want to check if this enote record is spent later in this chunk. So we save its transaction ID as a um, specula speculative uh, measure. So we, we're speculating that this enote record might be spent in this, in this same chunk. So we save its transaction ID. And then here, the, the third and final step, we do self-send pass-throughs. So there, there are two, two enote types in the ledger. There are normal enote types, which you just send to any address. And there are self-send enote types, which are constructed by uh, using a, a hash of the, of the view balance key. So the, the main Seraphist view key is hashed into these self-send enotes. This way, if you have a third-party scanner who is creating these these basic record these basic records for you, who is provisioning chunks to you, they will not be able to look in those chunks and identify self sends that you self sent yourself. The chunks will contain the self sends because of view tag matches, but there will be no further information that can be used to identify change outputs, and so this. This breaks the the input output or the input output uh, tracking that a uh, a third party scanner can do um, because the third party scanner won't be able to identify change. So they can only identify uh, outputs to the you or the or the enos that you receive to through the normal process. So we have a special scanning check or pass for self sends. So we have to look in all self sends that might, or sorry, we have to do a self send pass or a um, scanning pass on every e note in the basic records map that might contain a self, or that might be a self send. And so we identify which which of those tra which transactions those might be by saying so it's the it's all the transactions um, that either have we we know have spent e notes so these are um, so prior older e notes that we own were spent in this chunk or we also and we also check ch uh, check Um, or we also we also check. Uh, oh man, brain fart. Let's see. We also check the transactions that um, the new the new e notes that we received in this chunk. Um, we also check those. 
feel like I'm missing something, but let's see. Here is the self send pass and the transactions have spent enotes. For each transaction, anyway. So that's that's really all of the <laughs> all of the process trunk stuff. Any questions? It's, it's very complicated and probably takes a little bit of effort or of work to. I'm um, I'm wondering how did you test all of this? Did you try to send I don't know millions of blocks and see if uh, it was detecting correctly in your unit tests? Well, check out this file here. It's got nine thousand lines. This is called Seraphis Enote Scanning. <laughs> this is how I did it. I brute force. Brute force all of the test cases I could think of. <laughs> nice. Yep. Any other any other thoughts or questions on, on this process? Let's see, I can I'll switch the switch to this so that people can see it. Can we wait? Oh, do this too. Oh, that, that's not working. What the hell? Am I mic working right now? Click the button. Okay, well. That's annoying. So we have, we have a question here. The scanner today has an interesting async chunking mechanism where it, uh, sorry, let's go back to this. It has an interesting async chunking mechanism where it fetches a chunk of blocks to process and processes the prior fetch chunk while waiting for the response for the next chunk from the daemon. So the bottleneck should either be the request to the daemon for a chunk or local scanning. Does the higher level structure support something like this too? Uh, I suppose you could do that, yeah. So it's just it just does one chunk at a time. So with with this with this um, with this architecture, you should be able to you should be able to fetch any number of chunks and process them, and then um, stitch I... them to your your context. I, I think what he's commenting on is that it, it interleaves. So the CPU is spending time scanning the last chunk while it has a pending request of RPC being processed to return the next block. So there's sort of an, it, it, um, it reduces the latency because there's some latency in the Monero daemon to actually look up the request and complete it or whatever. So this is how it's interleaving it. I could be wrong though. This is the first time I've seen the code, but I think it was. Uh, the inter this interface was get next chunk process get next chunk so you couldn't uh you, you couldn't issue a request and then have it asynchronously come back to you you'd have to have like a you could probably do it with like a future or something like that i don't know i'd have to say that but that, that's what he was referring to like it's process it the cpu was processing the last chunk of blocks while the uh the monero daemon is currently retrieving the next chunk of blocks so the all the expensive stuff is hidden behind this call here, this get on chain chunk function. So all the all of the all of this scanning is cheap. B 
because you don't do any Diffie-Hellman exchanges. All this, all this scanning here is very, very cheap. When, once you get a chunk, it's cheap to check the chunk. Chunk checking is cheap. Creating chunks is expensive. So here in your you know, scanning context, we can go look at you know, scanning context simple. When you when you start a scanning con process, it, you you get you're told the initial start height and how big of a chunk how big the chunks you want returned. Once you get this call, you can go wild scanning whatever you want, and then and then and then saving it um, in the local or caching it in the local implementation. So this is an implementation of this interface. This guy can store whatever it wants in its cache. And then, and then it gets periodically it gets requested. Please give me the next chunk, and then it can just look in its cache for the next chunk that it has available, or block do a block, block until it's ready, and then send it out. So it doesn't really matter what happens between here and here. I again, I think you had a default. Hold on, let me see if there's another. There's no update from that person. Like I, I'm 99% sure that that the way that was handled before isn't exact. I mean, we could refactor, but we'd have to change the the code that's here. But to that person, we could probably do it. It the 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 problem here is that you that this call blocks, like you said, and that's sort of the the weirdness of it. You'd want a non-blocking call to that, so then then you can then go work on the previous chunk. That's the way it currently works now, and that's specifically for the the more expensive diffie helmet exchange so that we're doing all that cpu time while the 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 we're, and so we're hiding it because there's going to be http overhead network latency and so that we're trying to hide the network latency because otherwise you you have to block here and you're going to be waiting like this is part of what we're doing now uh jeff and i have to get the serialization time down because there's a lot of time spent in there but that's the other just if you're going to be spending a good i mean it's not a ton of time but you you, you end up spending i don't know like a quarter of a second or so and it and it but it amplifies over the long haul so anyway I, I think it's to that person i think it's possible to to make changes to handle that case but we'll have to change the the inside of this a little bit maybe maybe i don't know i have to look through it more well you you can somehow like suspend the you would you could return like a future to this is what you could do and then so it either blocks the imp the implementation either just blocks and just returns an immediate future or it does it hides the the network latency so you could do it either way that's the the that's like the javascript kind of way kind of thing but it does work yeah i'm still learning about how to design asynchronous programs so i'm not sure positive about the best option it's a mess, I think, would be in and um they're fixing this and kind of in like uh see plus twenty or seventeen, they're gonna have async functions very similar to Rust or C sharp. It's gonna be real similar to C sharp, actually, where you can yeah, uh but it's kind of complicated in your head how the compiler has to do it because it has to like automatically store the whole stack frame and do a bunch of other stuff. But um Unfortunately, for now, the best is like a few. If you're curious, is a future object or doing whatever in the heck ASIO does. But I would not recommend that. You're probably just better off returning a future, and then the implementation then has to handle what to do. Um, but then, yeah. I don't, anyway, that's a. I'll just shut up for now. All right. Well, someone has to work on that. That's not my project. So if you need, if someone needs help with that, then. Uh... Yeah, just let me know, but I will not be solving it. It'll probably be a slowly ongoing change internally to get it to that state, but and it's only if the numbers show up because you can see the the numbers. My my guess is I don't know when they ran the numbers, but I know historically there was a <laughs> the one that actually worked on this initially was been kicked from the community, but he ran the numbers in at least in wallet two back in the day, this was an issue. But remember, this is before the view tag scanning 
so that changes things a little bit um like the you know what i mean the the lightweight mode that we kind of have now yeah. uh, so the numbers change dramatically there too well i'm looking forward to a, a solution that maximizes speed but we'll see where how long it takes to get there yeah, the async is always rough because you always have like allocation overhead. So it's like, oh, just do it async, it'll be fast. But you typically end up having to allocate memory to to delay that request. And then that time, the, the time spent on the allocator is not trivial. So it's it's like, you it takes like, control? right. So if, like the RPC call responds in like, you know, I don't know, like three milliseconds or something insanely low. It's almost like, allocating memory to handle that in the future is more expensive sometimes so it gets it always seems like oh just async it, async it, async it but it's not always the case so you have to kind of yeah well, if smash a, it. I think a thread pool would be the answer there well even in a thread pool you end up having to allocate because like you're <laughs> you end up having a polymorphic call, call, callback even with a thread pool typically like unless your thread pool is like only doing one specific task like we have a thread pool but it takes polymorphic functions to run or whatever and then you end up it sometimes you don't have to allocate because it's amortized in the standard function but a lot of times you don't so it, it there's all these hidden allocations everywhere in the in the yeah. it, it, it again it depends heavily on the implementation but like that's what i know the languages struggle with this where it's like oh just async everything and then it's not really all that impressive yeah. if the rpc call was really quick or if the cpu time is so low for the view tag scanning now it's kind of pointless because it's so well, dominated it's does that make slow. any sense what i'm saying like if it's so dominated um there's a lot of factors in there but i i would just say just keep your implementation like focus on your implementation now and we can probably work around this it's not that big of a deal um i think it's well, what i'm trying to say because we'll have to like run some numbers again to know what <laughs> uh, text scanning is definitely slow because um it's like a hundred microseconds I think to do one and then if you got thousands of them it's many milliseconds right and so this is why we interleave the two because you have to wait like maybe i don't know probably like a hundred milli not microseconds 100 milliseconds to get the rpc call then plus all the microsecond time and all the scanning and so they were doing both at the same time is what it was it, this is what the async was interleaving but again you then have like to jack up your interface to do async and what the this is the problem with Walla too. Is so it worked well, but it, but you can't use it outside of Walla too. So, right. Anyway, just focus on what you've got now, because I think we can always, um, from what I'm seeing here, I think we can slowly change and update as needed, if if it's if it's needed at all. Okay. Okay. So Jeffro's question: Does the order of chunks in which they appear matter? Uh, yes. You want your chunks to be one after the other. Or to be contiguous. Yeah, sorry that that one that was badly worded. <laughs> I guess what more what I was trying to say. So like, if something gets processed twice after the way the balance recovery works now, does it handle that? Um, if it gets if it happens to get processed twice, there shouldn't be any problems. Okay. I I tried to add a uh, duplicate handling, so if there are duplicates showing up, it's okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, let's see. Okay, so who is this person? Someone? <laughs> is this Justin? I don't know, but the, the oh, it's oh, it's Jay. Yeah, yeah, it's the other the other Justin. Oh, yeah. yeah. So he oh. he commented. Um, okay. that he see, he agreed that it seemed like little refactoring due to async would be needed. So that's just an update um, because I don't think anyone yeah, watching this, the video can see the chat. This is Jay Berman's big project is he's getting this this baby working. I was, that's what I had in my imagination in my fantasies. <laughs> okay. Um, well, that was. That's like, those are all like the main parts. We can look at input selection here. We've got, uh, 
we've got these reference set index mappers. We've got well, we've got more wrappers for the uh, decoy selection. We've got for Seraphos, we have this ref set index mapper. For Legacy, we have the decoy selector um, wrapper. Right now, I have the, the, them mocked up. So the Legacy does a flat distribution and here, flat. And the Seraphos does also a flat distribution. Those guys will have to be implemented at some point. Oh, Justin, your your audio is now on, I guess. Oh, nice. OK. Uh, I have one more question. Um, so it seemed like the scanner, as implemented, is um, pointing to, it could be pointing to a daemon the same way as today that's serving the full chunks, or it could be pointing to some remote scanner that's serving just the chunks of the plausibles. That's that's how I understood it, right? So so basically, this local scanner that you've implemented has access to every key, um, meaning the the fine the fine balance key. That's that's the case, right? Like that's how it's it's in, uh, there's some separate. So this this simple um, this simple scanner just wraps a you know finding context, uh, which is. Here, you know, finding context. You know, finding context is like a convenient intermediate wrapper for 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 um, context where it's actually needed. You can you can implement the uh, the scanning context to have whatever internals you want. But one way to do it is to include to use a, a finding context. In the in the finding context, we we're we're just getting chunks. That's all we do is we get chunks, uh, and it's a it's a const function. Um, so there's no state in the enote finding context. And so for the mockup of the enote finding context, here we have enote finding context wraps a mock ledger context and the find received key, and then it forwards to the mock ledger context. Please get me a chunk. And that it just does this synchronously. There's no async here. So if we go to the mock ledger context, get on chain chunk. We, I have it a little bit or locked up for uh, async to just like model what an async environment would be like. Uh, get on chain chunk in the mock ledger context. So this is it's basically get get chunk in the scanning is forwarded to the mock ledger context here just for convenience in this mockup. And so it, it's given how much how big the chunk is supposed to be and the find received key. And the find received key is used here in this in the mock ledger context to make chunks. So this so this function call is expected to be like a a read lock on the the, the database so that there's no so it's an atomic operation. Find receive key. We go through a bunch of uh, whatever administrative crap to get to the the actual scanning loop here, where we loop through all of the blocks, and we find received each block. So we we loop through all the transactions in the block. And we try try find received um, for the transactions or for the, the transact in that transaction. Did I answer your question? I might have lost track of what the question was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like you have this separate pulled out part of the scanner that only has the find received key um, and is pulling chunks from the daemon. Um, yeah. And then you have a separate port part of the scanner that is distinct that uh, that you then call with the find balance key to yep. do the rest of the goodies. So pretty much sounds like you could have any type of scanner you want with using reusing all this kit, which is nice. Which is very that's nice. that's my goal. That's what I that's what I was hoping for.
Because because well, there the problem with this library is it has to be generic enough for like whatever you want to do with it. So there's that's why I have all these reference wrappers everywhere. Right. Yeah, I I think we can work with this, but I I my suspicion is that the multi wallet case is always that's always the it's just slightly different enough where it gets frustrating. So we'll I guess we'll find out as we go along. True. By multi wallet, I mean like the LWBOS handling multiple actual users where as opposed to one high level account key that with multiple sub accounts like multiple primary accounts it's just i don't know whatever it ends up being kind of funky sometimes but we'll figure it out i think i think we can work with this okay good um if not we'll uh, just we'll just hit up your github repo endlessly with issues and <laughs> yes are there any other topics I should discuss here? Because I mean, there's still plenty of other things like details going on. I mean, the only high level thing I'll note is that this this folder is is massive because it's changing. Not only it, it's just it, it's like it's doing a lot in here. So I mean, that's the the, the next thing I've only thought. This has nothing to do with what you're going with, but I mean, the review is going to be very interesting because you're basically it's proposing changes partially to wallet to and the ring ct stuff not really so much bulletproofs obviously but then also we get a new uh ad i mean none of the address i mean there's just a lot changing here so i mean i think it's inevitable but um it's just yeah it's really hitting me like how much uh we're gonna have to go through at some point which is gonna be interesting there are many, many months worth of review in this code base. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what I'm thinking. It's going to be like, I don't know that I've ever had to, I can't speak everyone else, but this is, this is like a mega, I think I might just have to start now and just keep going through the code base because otherwise if I wait until it just gets dropped on my head, it's going to be like serious pain. So um, something to think about, Justin, <laughs> and Jeffro as well, uh, and or in day, I don't know, not, yeah. Yes, I agree. Um, so, so this code base is is pretty close to stable right now. I'm in on my uh, on my other account. I'm working on a updating multisig to be able to spend multisig inputs, and that's a that's a big refactor. Or not, I don't know refactor, but it's going to add a lot of code to the multisig stuff. But otherwise, it won't touch anything. And then after that, I have to add Coinbase transaction type. So TX type squashed V1, or no, TX type Coinbase V1, I guess. Don't then, don't worry about changing stuff because we're gonna have to like go through it. But then I'm just saying that when when I see the review, I'll recognize parts of it so it, it goes quicker. Because when you start from square one, you're literally like, what is this function? Like, where does this function even go? It's like magic. You just see a function. Like, what the heck does this even do? Right. So. Yeah. Well, I'm just I'm just saying that there's there's not much that's gonna change that I have planned to change because I'm close to the end. I think I hope. Yes, and I also want to comment. I I haven't commented on Jamtus, but I've gone I went through most of the comments on there, which I found interesting. Um, and Jamtus refers to for those listening refers to the. Uh, I guess the new addressing scheme and the new way that the you sent I don't know what you call it, like the protocol on the blockchain I think would be the way to for it. like there's I don't know how else you would describe that but um, I just found all parts of it interesting I don't have much many comments I can think of at this point. Um, so there's a question here: Which structs classes re represent the on-chain transaction data? So I did a I did a serial serialization uh, demo about like well, how I thought it could be done. Here it's basically reproducing all of the all of the objects that need to be serialized as serializable objects, so that they're all contained within one file without serialization details leaking into the rest of the uh, library. So it is a, it is kind of verbose, or it's definitely verbose. Um, 
but this allows us to do like the serialization optimizations that you that you expect so like for example balance proofs contain partial bullet proofs um, which don't record the uh, the amount commitments even though the bullet proofs struct wants to have uh, the amount commitments recorded and then and then there's, there's some other stuff too like uh, all the indices are as or recorded as offsets or serialized as offsets but in the main code base they're recorded as explicit indices for convenience and so that when you do you can deterministically um, get the size of a transaction and the weight of a transaction uh, without knowing like the actual uh, how big the variants are or how big the serialized blob will actually be and this this lets you do um, more accurate input selection uh, because you can know the transaction fee in advance without needing to like estimate anything. You'll know exactly what the fee will be because you can you can know exactly what the transaction weight will be. Uh, so with the nice. so with the so serialization, you I have all this. This very verbose, definitely verbose mess of or, or mass, I guess, of of functions that convert between the serializable and the actual uh, stru structure. And then, so if you want to serialize, you just uh, let's see. I can show you the the demo here. We've got a serial a serialization unit test. Make a transaction. You make it a serial. You convert it to serializable. You serialize, then you deserialize, and then you recover it uh, like that. That's 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 what I've got. I don't know if that'll actually how that'll actually if a lot if that will actually work in practice. Ugh. That's all I've got. Unless you, if you guys have more questions. Backing up a little bit to the, every time I see the keyword partial, is should the default assumption be this um, set of data, blob of data that's part of a transaction which still needs to be completed at some later point? Is that is it the, the term partial? Is that how it's used consistently across? Uh, no, for for serialization, partial means it's a partial struct. Meaning that the, the full struct is not serialized here, so you'll have to get this data from later on. Well, I guess I guess yes is the answer because when you're deserializing, you need to get this data from somewhere else. So if we go look, I right, go here and then here, it's here. We go to balance proof. We collect the amount commitments from the input images and outputs, and then pass those into the recovery so that we can um, we pass those in as inputs instead of deserializing them directly from the serializable proof. So we move these in from outside instead of from the serializable. Serial is here. Does that answer your question? And then, okay, and then once you've recovered, like, are you saying that th these are existing bulletproofs that are, that are already constructed? And so, so this partial, is it either like, okay, earlier when you, when you use the term partial, it was in reference to a chain transaction, right? The, so yeah. now in this case, this is more like, this seems more like a prune transaction is how, is how I'm, I'm imagining it because, or, or are you saying that like this, if you're recovering an existing bulletproof, that like yeah. you're completing this transaction that's already been pruned, that's already exists. So, so this, so this thing was is a serialized bulletproof plus, but we don't serialize the entire thing. We, we serialize most of it, 
And then the remaining piece we have to get from somewhere else because we don't want a duplication in our transaction. It's serialized. Because these, so for example, in bulletproofs, we have the amount commitments which are stored in the bulletproof. The, the, the commitments that are range proof are stored there. But these are duplicated with the, the commitments stored in the outputs. So we don't want to we don't want the, the blob to contain duplicates. So we don't store them in the bulletproof, the serializable bulletproof. We just pass those in from somewhere else when we're recovering the balance proof. I see. I get it. I mean, my only comment, I'm not sure having these two separate trucks. There's a decent amount of data copying. They're 32 bytes long. I, I don't know. It'd be the current method of just having the serialization I, we can work around having the the compile time and all that issue we're, we're, i've been working on that but i don't know something i don't know having the separate structure serializing is the best approach given how many 32 byte keys we got to copy but maybe it's i mean this is what we this is what we've got this is what we've got in the uh <laughs> this I'm is sorry. the code that we have to look at when we're thinking about right but so the other thing you have to remember like it depends on what you're serializing for like so that this this stuff is really really gross don't get me wrong but it's the most compact when going into the database form and then there's the other serialization um uh, possibly to expand it into something like a json context or whatever so the difference is that like the there's other serializations your math methods you had they're not the most compact that we can actually do so I don't, there's like all kind of stuff like that. Like, I don't know, we're gonna have to go through because um, the difference would be like, um, and Jeffro and I have talked this a lot, there's, there's, everything is in order precisely on that in the one serialization format. And so it's really, really gross what's going on there, but it's designed to use the least amount of bytes as possible, which is kind of why it looks so gross. But like, I yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it can always be improved, but it's just that we end up. Hmm, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to look at the numbers on on because it's gonna uh, the the serial if we if we serialize that way directly to the database, it's going to be bigger than using the other serialization technique. And I'm referring to the one that has the macros that you're they were you using that said like. KB serialized, whatever that, that that expands bigger than the other one. Um, oh, I, I was just using what I know how to use. It's a demo. No, so. I mean it's fine. We got to get it working. I'm just saying that like that's the two things that one is. So yeah, so this one right here. No, this is the. No, sorry, this is actually the more compact format, if I recall. Uh, I might be wrong about this because the, the macros are look so similar. But no, so th this is fine. It's just that the. The, the trouble is that we end up doing a lot of data copying because there's two different structs that are completely different. You had all those methods, but every one of those keys, like the, the key vector is fine. That, that's actually like 12 bytes to copy or uh, no, six, um, 24 bytes to copy. But I see they're all like 32, 24 bytes to copy over there. So it gets, and then you multiply that out by like the whole blockchain and it ends up being a shocking amount of copying, just small data to change the struct type. So whether it's worth, having these separate types entirely I, I, I don't know we'll find we'll figure that out i guess a bit later but um. i uh i welcome i welcome uh proposals for more efficient but also clean yeah what we're doing that's what we're kind of kind of like trying to improve upon but it it ended up being yeah i don't I don't, I don't even want to comment on it. I could be talking for hours about it. Yeah, well, yeah, you just go, okay, yeah, you just show this function again, and you want to vomit. So, like, <laughs> so like part, you understand, like, part of what someone did in there was uh, there's a, typically with a vector, there's a size that's that's written before the vector amount. And they recognize, well, all these vectors are exactly the same size, so what if we just wrote the size once and then just manually skip because like the code is autom when, it, when, it, when the code detects a vector, it automatically writes out the size before writing all the elements. And so someone was like, well, I mean, all these are definitely going to be the same size vectors. So what if we just skip all that? And that's why some of the, there's like tons of grossness in here because it, 
it's sort of like literally the most compact you can be. And I was like, oh, these next three vectors are all the same size, so whatever. But it's really annoying mm -hmm. because there's tons oh, of custom. Good. Right. So there's like it, it's like based on the number of outputs or whatever. So it's like, OK, so what if we just wrote up the size once and then just but then you would a hand, but then that revolved a lot of hand rolling of all kinds. Of, this is why you see like begin array and um, because, in fact, you see it right there. So it says variant field NBP, that's the size. Then the array gets begin. And then there's no other read for a size, even though there's tons of vectors because it's like, oh, it's always the same vector size. Right. And then, yeah, anyway, I believe that's how it's done. So it, it's slick in the sense that like it saves i don't know whatever like uh, a couple bytes per field or whatever but as far as readability and like what the heck's going on in there you're just your response is usually the correct one like what the heck is this well it's or even just like return ra dot good just randomly like it's just like oh yeah this type yeah just return and then it's like we're not even I mean, those are clearly max sizes for 32 bytes i think but it's like instead of using max 32 int we just damn. <laughs> sorry it's just everything possible made it hard to read but anyway so yes i agree with you but we'll we'll work on i think we can work on that separately again you've got to focus on uh, uh there's just a lot that you still got to do so don't worry about the serialization part because like that's been a constant battle anyway and i also wanted to make sure stuff like this is actually accessible and like you know where it's coming from because this function is just so obscure but it's <laughs> critical because it contains this like who knows about that i don't know. yeah like I, if you I, don't call it your your everything about your transaction is messed up and you don't know like let's see where it's called it's called here and here and here in these These three functions here, parse and validate TX, blah, blah, blah. So I guess it's kind of in the right spot, but you don't know that you need to look here to understand what's going on. Yeah, well, I don't know. Right. Well, to expand on the, the, the problem that you're having is that the zero and QJSON, instead of writing out a blob, tried to write out each independent field with the idea being that it'd be easier for downstream projects, because otherwise they have to know about this custom serialization format that's not JSON. So they try to break up each, but then the problem was you had to like mimic what was going on in here to recreate the transaction correctly. And you had to know that, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know how else to describe like it. it um, yeah, this is like the ongoing pain that we've had with transactions basically, because the internal format, none of like the, the Java program or JavaScript or whatever have any clue how that format works. It's just that when you break it apart anyway, you still end up with this problem where you don't you don't serialize every single field. So then even if they're not using C++, how do they even handle that, right? So I, I don't know. It might be the case that like we're we're just better off just doing our custom format always because like the downstream projects are screwed. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I've thought about this. This is a whole nother topic actually. So I'll just stop. Okay. But yeah, you're not, you're not wrong about your complaints. It's just really the, the problem we end up with is that we have like so much custom cryptography and everything going on here. And I don't, I don't really know a good way. I've never really seen this in a performer project where the downstream projects want to say like, it should be really, really simple. I should just JSON this and I get it. And it's like, well, yeah, I guess, but there's like tons of weird cryptogra cryptographic values in here that are hard to, yeah. Anyway, that, that's the struggle that we've had, I think, with downstream projects and scanning in general is that it, it relates to serialization, but then also even if we do it, everything, literally everything in JSON, you still have this problem of like, it has to match the bulletproof values have to match exactly what is, happens internally, right? And so, I don't, know. I don't think we're, I don't think we're, I don't think I don't see a way around it really at this point. Maybe Jeffro has some other things that to, uh, there's some text in the chat box, but I don't think. Um... Yeah, I don't really have any solutions to that at the moment. 
Yeah, the, the, the um, problem is we're doing custom cartography so much that I think we're always kind of screwed, basically. But maybe you have something else to say. Yeah, I have, no, yeah. Uh, sorry, go on. Oh, you, go, you go ahead. I have some issues also when uh, I see this, uh, when you see the bulletproof is ser serialization, you see the RCT um, structure defined to points and uh, scholars. And uh, it's kind of hard to understand the first time I'm reading this, what exactly is uh, referring to, so. Well, yeah, because you have to read the white paper. <laughs> He's saying like they're just these. It's like what is L? What is R? What are like what are all these variables? But the problem is you end up having to read the whole. And this is the other problem with downstream projects. Hey, they are like, what do I do? No, with that's all this? not that's not what I'm saying. Oh, okay. I'm saying that uh, the. It was the ring CT that changed that the typing behavior, which was kind of interesting. So maybe you could elaborate what happened on Seraphis then. So for Seraphis, my policy was or became uh, to use crypto secret key for anything that need to be memory safe and RCT key for everything else, just because it's a convenient data block. <laughs> blob type that I can pass around. That's without introducing new types. That's what I decided. Okay. Well, I think all the RCP got his answer. Uh, all the SCP is recording again, by the way. That's all I want to say. Oh, okay. Uh, well, if you introduce new types, then you have to introduce a whole new library of crypt crypto functions. Oh, right. Because you're reusing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you gotta do all this stuff again. You gotta duplicate all this stuff for your new types, or you gotta do uh, wrapper. Uh, yeah, yeah. We yeah. like went we slightly backwards, and it's hard to replace. It's hard to fix now. Yeah, yeah. Just a just a comment I wanted to make, <laughs> but because uh, if if we are just using this, just the way we differentiate, it's just by using lowercase and yeah, and uh, uppercase. It's uh, yeah, maybe we could have done it. I don't know, just to, or explain this better because, um, yeah, it makes some difference in, in the future. If if you don't know if it's a point or a scalar in the later, maybe you, yeah, I don't know, you can get in trouble somehow. Yeah, I'm also not sure why they. I don't know. We'd have to ask the the original author. The, no, the original author isn't in the chat, so um, I I don't even know if anyone else knows why. They dropped that feature that was around before. 
Um, but I noticed that as well. It is it it gets good because if if you mess up the order of the fu of the function call, you can easily screw up the entire function. I guess the answer is you have to unit test it, but it it's really annoying because the 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 type checking system doesn't help at all. So. Well, that's that's Shen no there, and he's a long gone. Well, that that that's that's what I mean. Like if we're not gonna get the answer to that, so. Yeah, yeah, fine. Thanks. Um, so for the MX, the MX, I wrapped the MX two five five one nine library, and so we have these three key types now. So that, I guess that's what you're looking for. Um. Oh, right. So that's Tivador's library. Oh, buddy. Uh, that's interesting for better or worse. I, I, had to, I had to wrap it so that I could have these other other functions here. Yeah, he added. It looks like I'll just see what he did. I forgot about this. It was ARM64 stuff that we don't have in. Well, he's using the he's using X2, X25519 instead of. Uh, Ed two five five one nine, so that's faster. Oh right, because I that whole super cop code right. I forgot you also changed. Jamtis also changes the key exchange, uh, call to x two five five one nine, which is in why you have all this stuff. Oh man, right. Okay, sorry, I forgot. Um. Right, you can. Oh, man, okay. Well, the only other comment I'm gonna make, I guess it doesn't matter, but just something to think about. Uh, we initially did not use assembly speedups for chain verification, but we used it only for wallet. And the rationale at the time, anyway, was we were worried about chain splits because technically the ARM64, AMD64, and portable are three different implementations. Where in theory, the portable implementation, but again, though, how portable it is, et cetera, et cetera. But oh, but this is for wallet scanning, right? So, yeah. no, it, right. You're right, right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There's no, there's no uh, validation. Right. It just occurred to me that this is only the Pretty wallet sure. side stuff. Right. Right. Because the, um, oh, man. So does it, I mean, so I guess since we're on the topic, then are you still using the Ed twenty five one nine curve for like the basic proof stuff? You know, by proof stuff, I mean uh, validating that it's. Not unspent, you know, I think you generally get what I'm saying. It's like the general, is it only the wallet's getting set that's switched to that other curve? Yeah. And, okay. Everything else is at 255. Okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah. So for yeah. better or worse. All right. Okay. Yeah, man, this is this this is gonna be a huge change, but oh my goodness, there's just a lot. Um when it was proposed, I knew it was gonna be a lot of work, but really seeing it, it's like really hitting you. Yep, it's a lot. It's a whole year's worth of typing. <laughs> More than a year now. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. <laughs> it's uh... Unbelievable! How what a human brain can do. <laughs> I've often wondered how long it took the original implementation to code out because we actually don't know that either. But that's just an. I think it must have been a couple of years, two or three years. I've I've wondered about this as well because it 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 almost seems like oh it only took them a couple months, but there was it, there's no shared code anywhere else that I've seen really, so it's kind of interesting. Seem like multiple people too, right? You see multiple names. The, the one I, that's I was like Antonio Juarez or whatever, but then like, uh, like there's different. Yeah. Uh, there's at least two different styles, maybe three. I think is what you're commenting on. You can see kind of different programming, so like at least two, possibly three or four, but at least two. Well, all the Epi stuff is the one guy who's doing Zeno now, and then all the cryptography is from some mysterious person. And then the blockchain stuff is probably from another guy. That's what I mean. It's at least two, I think realistically probably three. And you can, like like you're saying, you can tell just by the raw style that there's a, like I said, um, but yeah, it had to take him, 
man, I don't even know. Because, like, the wallet stuff, too. Oh, man. Like, yeah. Anyway. Well, the wallet was only 500 lines on February 2014. Really? Oh, I... Interesting. Okay. The very first commit is 500 lines. <laughs> Since then, it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> wow all right uh see so you know more about the that uh but yeah anyway this is um now actually do we have oh man that's it because we don't even have any x curved 2509 code at all so we actually have to part a little well okay it's not too bad um but the one thing that we need what that someone needs to do is uh Validate the in this library. Validate the test vectors. And also, also there's Blake to be. We need to make sure the test vec or get some tech vec test vectors running. We use I use tech Blake to be for the hashing. Yeah, I did some uh, mm. some uh, tests with your library with Blake to be. And it seems it's working, but I didn't do a comprehensive test. So, but at least with another implementation, it's the same result. And Was that also chosen for performance reasons, or? Yeah, it also has a keyed hash uh, interface, which is very nice. Right, right. I think it actually does a actual HMAC in there, um, yeah, which I have to use for um, the noise protocol, actually. So. So we've got the hash base here. This is the only call to Blake to be in the library. And as you can see, it's very generic and nice and convenient. And it's faster, so that's why I picked yeah. it. Yeah, there is, uh, I don't know if I sent you this message about this Blake 3. Maybe it's four times faster than this one, but um, I, I didn't test. And uh, I don't know if we should do this because it was uh, created in 2020 i think and this one in 2012 if i'm not wrong so maybe uh, there's 80 years of uh, being proved and uh, but yeah this is pretty much faster blake too but, also went through the the hash competition so there was a lot of review before uh yeah i don't know I'm sure Blake 3 has been reviewed, but not probably like the Blake 2. Yeah. We also have two fish. I'm not sure we need test vectors for two fish as well. Yeah, I saw that in the jam test proposal, which is interesting. That was to handle a clever way of handling sub accounts, as I recall, right? Or all the address tag stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it. Um... I mean, are we worried about the long-term ramifications of whether that ever gets cracked, or is it relatively assumed that two fish will be okay? I think two fish is pretty old. Yeah, I, think, I mean that is true. I think you, you chose two fish because it's performance and it's you wanted a block cipher as opposed to a stream cipher, I think. And then uh, no, you needed a block cipher because like the stream cipher would have had initialization vector issues and and cracking yeah. issues so you need a block cipher and i guess the really the only choices were two fish or aes since it's faster right so it's also a lot easier to deal with i think than than aes yeah. i think it would be about yeah. the same but i don't know that um well i had a lot of pain dealing with aes but uh i think it is faster it. and simpler Okay. So mm -hmm. well, if you if you you have to tell me privately about your your pains about AES, but I know there's all kind of caching or uh, CPU timing issues and all that. I do know that OAES was pretty slow. The one that we have in the library already. Oh really? So then I was like hunting around for other implementations. Really interesting. Oh god. And this is so ugly. This double double pointer. I was like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, man. You don't remember? Yeah. I never, <laughs> I never did any of the C stuff. <laughs> that's when you gotta change your pointer. That's that's a... <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I needed a sixteen byte block size, so that's why two fish or AES says sixteen two. Right, but I, I think my 
when I first saw it, I was like, why the heck aren't they using, because something even faster would have been Cha-Cha, but the problem is it's not a block cipher. And it looks like that design, you definitely need a block cipher because you're going to have distorted initialization mm -hmm. vector or something. So this sidestepped everything by being a block cipher, basically. And you didn't need to do multiple blocks, so the ECB didn't, didn't problem didn't trigger, right? So just all kind of interesting. Yep, just one more detail amongst all the details. Well, yeah, in this case, it mattered because, like, I think I was looking at LWS is going to have to, it's like, oh, I get, like, sub-accounts with this now on LWS or something. I don't know, but anyway. Well, the, uh... It actually looks so the, easier uh, from the oh, LWS standpoint. Right, there's no, there's no more look-ahead. Well, right, because the, 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 the massive advantage is that I don't have to have, the problem with LWS implementing sub-accounts in the current implementation is that I have to store like this expanded table per user account. And so when you have like software that's like potentially running thousands of user accounts, you get thousands of user accounts times thousands of sub-accounts or whatever, possibly. And it's just kind of annoying, whereas this sidesteps all of that, you just, it's flat, basically. Well, you have to, you have to, you can only allow users who have Surface accounts because if you have mixed accounts, then you still need the look head for legacy recovery. Right. Um, Surface only. Yeah, I'm not sure what we're going to do in LWS about that. That'll be interesting because we'll, the, the API is going to have to handle, we'll probably just forcibly upgrade where you have to sweep. I don't know. I see the problem. Well, it had a nice API proposal for uh, sub addresses. It came up with a uh, Paul, it's in the, uh, the REST API um, issues. It's just been sitting there, though. It's it's like, I mean, just that level of complexity versus, you know, just being able to decrypt is just so, it's, it's like, it's, it sounds really nice to me all around. Plus, there's the general issue of people who don't, who have, like, far out one-off addresses who just miss their stuff, um, miss recovering their that that just that that issue seems to crop up every once in a while. That's just yeah, annoying. Because I think just the weird thing is that the it's almost like an attack vector in the current method where the person can just keep request saying like I need to I need all these look aheads and then you end up just like using all this memory depending on your yep. implementation. And, and so it like seems really simple like oh you just really simple but like if you're doing enterprise stuff it's like really annoying because someone could just hammer you so. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There was another thing that I was. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say I think that handle um, handling leg legacy stuff is gonna keep coming back as an annoyance. That's really like a persistent annoyance. Because I found that when I was implementing everything, I was like, oh, I've got to I've got to support legacy. So now I've got months of work left. Well, yeah, because theoretically, someone could still have pre racing T. Uh, monies that are that are still valid it's right it's just uh well like when, when they do the turnstile stuff it's annoying but you can you can get why they do it though that was a reference to zcash by the way oh. <laughs> anyway justin what did you i was curious to get your hear your thoughts lee on the um so so highlighted how like uh, the scanner can is able to pick up um, viewers like the self spends so even if you have uh, a zero change transaction that you send to somebody else um, like I I send somebody else a zero change and um, the scanner is still able to pick up on that um, because we def the, this library defaults to constructing a dummy output that the, that key is able to pick up on different well, than today. It's more um, than a default that it, it's expected because if if anybody decides to break from the expected behavior, then suddenly balance recovery everywhere is broken. Right. Well, only that, but there's like fingerprinting stuff too, where if you have a one output transaction, uh, you know, it kind of sticks. Up. I mean, I don't know how important that is, but that's something that when they do statistical analysis, it stands out. So there's that. Well, even right now, there's you can only you can have two outputs or, or more, not one output. 
Today, okay, right, right. You no, know, this is this is on the output side. So like today, what what the wallet does in, is constructs a dummy output, and so that every transaction will at least have two outputs, even if it's a zero change. But that dummy output, you can't tell that that dummy output oh. is created because it doesn't go back to your to your uh your view key. Like and that's how you can get a dummy output. And that's how you can get a misbalance today on the LWS. Because LWS can almost calculate the balance, but there's there's a few edge cases that ruins it. Yes, and it, exactly. And it's entirely how the wallet the send decides to send data. And if it had just sent it with a dummy thing that went back to itself, you can you can still track it, right? So yeah. Um yeah, I don't this doesn't seem to really come up other than it puts more work on the client a little bit when even though the server seems to know almost know everything anyway but right the 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 cost to scan for self sends is also basically nothing because it's it's all the information is embedded in the um encrypted address tag so you just do a cipher Oh, so that's oh, that's right. So it actually says, as opposed to account, that says this is a self spend or whatever. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, when you're doing a self, oh, I see. Yeah, I see. Right. You have a self send payment proposal, and then you're making the encrypted address tag. We do this to make the encrypted address address tag. We do. Um. The actual address tag XORed with a hash of the sender receiver secret and the one time address. And in self sends, the sender receiver secret is not a Diffie Hellman, it's a hash of this stuff the ephemeral pub key and the input context and your view balance key. So you just do a hash and then another hash and then an XOR to get the address tag and then decipher the address tag using your whatever cipher tag stuff to de decipher this and then you get the j in the mac check the mac now you have your address index and you can continue on with your recovery balance recovery so it's cheap in conclusion Right, it's that find receives that that initial uh change that is the uh bulk of scanning time. So it seems and then and then when you're scanning you you iterate through all the you iterate through all the self send types doing a try you try to uh decipher for that type. And then So, so when you're when you have when you're going from a you know to a you know record, the first thing you test is getting the address index, which is cheap because decrypting is cheap. Yeah, it's an XOR and a hash. This guy is cheap too because it's just ash. And so the 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 self send types are just are distinguished by with dom domain separators. Um, in the hash when you're making the self send secret, send receiver secret. It's just cryptography. A lot of this, a lot of this balance recovery stuff is also in my Monero Con, Monero Con presentation. If you want to watch that video, again. Still haven't uploaded mine. Oh really? We can pester him about it. I emailed him recently. He said he's still on it. Okay. Anyway, are you guys have anything else you want to hear about in this library? I don't know if I really expressed the architecture. This was supposed to be an architecture walkthrough. 
And okay. Carrie's apartment is more than fine. <laughs> as if it as Carrie's about to the discre discretize E. Stuff. Oh, the P? Uh, where is that? Here, discretize B. Here. Did you go over that earlier and I miss it? Oh. No, you can talk about it. Yeah, yeah that's fun guy. <laughs> uh, so it's just a fee selected from a limited set of fee values, valid fee values. And so you convert back and forth. And this is how I, um, this is the ugly thing that generates the, the fee values. Is the intent, I don't remember. Now, is this the attempt to make this a consensus check? I don't remember if it is now. I don't think it is, but is that? Yeah, it's in the validator somewhere. Right, so this, because I think this is uh, something that the nonsense lab had pointed out, that this is kind of like one of the ways you can uh, yeah. identify wallets was through this method, I think, or something like that, right? Yeah. Validating the fee here. Hmm. The and then here. It just tries to uh, recover the fee. And if the discretized fee value is not valid, then it fails. So it just does a, it looks in the it's, uh, file scope data, static variable right now that just stores the fee values. So today we have like, we have the priorities, right? We have like the one through four. Um, one, two, three, four, and then that selects it. So what, what's the, uh, you run through it from like the user facing level down into the, to the nitty gritty details, how it, how it, uh, how it works. Okay. So, well, the, this is, this is unrelated to fee priorities. So the fee, this is, yeah, this is just in fee values. See, these are all the possible fee values that you can have. And I think there are a hundred of them in the, in the current uh how i have it set up it's like multiples of 1.5 i think so each each fee level is 1.5 above the multiplied by the previous fee value from zero up to max I up to an low maybe not what's that the, the, the 100 seems kind of low for the total number of but maybe maybe not five to the power of a hundred. Oh, I see. So, yeah. Okay. And, uh, so let's see here. So we, when we're looking at input selection, we can ask the, let's see, the, uh, here, get fee for the fee calculator. So we pass in, let's see, let's go here. The calculator, boxed, squashed. All right, so we, so when we're calculating, here's, here's calculating the fee. We get a fee per weight, we get a weight, and then this, this gives you a fee, a specific, specific fee value that's arbitrary, like normal. But then we discretize the fee and here it's just checking that it actually um, is a valid representation. This is a sanity, sanity check. So, so we discretize the fee and then convert it back into an actual amount. And so it, it kind of like filters all the fee values that you request into discretized values or into the into the but the the hundred, the hundred valid buckets, right? Or buckets for values. And so, I mean, the advantage here is that you have way fewer fee val value possibilities. So you, there's less. Um, you don't leak this fee per weight value as much. So fee per fee per weight is contextual to when you when you make a transaction proposal, because you get this from what is the current, how many 
transactions are being submitted right now and uh, what's the block median and stuff like that. There's a whole algorithm for figuring out what the minimum fee and then also if there's a fee market and this comes from the fee market. But by discretizing the fee, there's less precision about the final fee value um, published. So timing information is reduced. But yeah, it's but, also uh, you can't. I can't do my prices right move where I'm like Justin's fee plus one to bump me in the. <laughs> you can't do that anymore. Well, you, you can still do the next. You just, you just multiply it by another one point five. Well, right. I mean, I just want to. I want the I'm just, just one. Pico XMR, whatever it's called. <laughs> yeah. But what you're, what you're saying exposes the problem with the fee priorities we currently have is it's kind of an artificial wallet level convention for deciding what, how much fee to pay. But an alternate wallet could has no reason not to um, ignore the fee priorities and uh, like optimize their chances of uh, getting into the next block by do, doing whatever the default fee priority is plus one plus plus one pico xmr uh, in their fee because the fee priority is an artificial bump it's like it actually doesn't make any sense to have an artificial fee priority level when okay so the idea with the fee priority is you have to increase your fee enough so that you can convince miners to add your transaction. But if everybody is using the fee priorities, then what are you like competing against? You're competing against other priorities. Instead of you're not competing against the lowest priority plus one. I don't know if I'm expressing how confusing it is in practice. Well, no, you're you're not wrong. Like 99.9% .9 of people are just using the these default values which aren't consensus which it means other random people will just say they just implement their own weird priority schedule which then you can now fingerprint like who's not using wallet too i think uh yeah. like you could probably almost tell how many people are using my monero or just light wallets in general by this and then or third even a yet yeah, a third party wallet yeah so my idea is to get rid of fee priorities completely and use use a more like a real-time algorithm to figure out, okay, so right now I'm making a transaction proposal. Um, what are the different fee amounts in order to get my transaction confirmed within zero, one, two, three, how many blocks? So at this fee, fee amount, the probability I get into the, the next block is 90%. But if I use um, a fee half of that amount or whatever, then I'll, I'll get in to the, the third block with 90% confidence. And this way, users can look at a set of fee proposals or fee, fee um, so the, the, the client spits out a bunch of different fee amounts alongside the the confirmation level that those fee amounts can are um, not confirmation, but delay that you can expect with with using that fee. So it's like yeah. it reads it read that you you read the, the blockchain to see or not the block yeah, the other blockchain to see what are what are current transaction volumes and fee amounts doing, and then you estimate what fee you need it for a given delay and then the user can select what delay they want and what fee they want or what fee delay pair they want and that's how it should work i think yeah that's definitely the uh the correct i think that the way it would eventually progress to you needing to be implemented is how, is how it works on ethereum i think i've seen it in bitcoin stuff too but uh like you want to spend an ethereum Make an Ethereum transaction, 
it's usually a good move to go check like what current gas fees are to get you into a transaction within two minutes. I'm looking at it right now. It's two minutes, five minutes, and 30 minutes. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's how... Uh, so the the discret, discretized fee doesn't really help with that too much, but they're I guess they're related. Um, I see the benefit of the discretized fee, how you mentioned of like, if if you have if stuff's changing with each block and you're contracting a transaction at one point, like you could have like someone's transaction a transaction five seconds ago or a minute ago, and and you can tell by the the precision of the fee. Um, but if you discretize it, it gets rid of that. Yeah. Invisibility option. See that. And if the if the um, if the fee is relatively stable, then it could be as much as like days or weeks ago that you made the proposal, and that that way, multi-sig transactions can appear as if they were very recently made. Right, because you can construct the membership just later once you're ready to submit it. And that so then that all the timing process. information is is lost, unless you have legacy inputs, in which case your legacy ring signatures will be made at or will be specified at the beginning. But over time, that'll that'll go away, like pretty quickly, within a few years. They'll all be surface. Cool. Okay. Any other uh, any other things you got in here? You can look at the input selection algorithm. It's kind of uh, complicated. The goal here is to find a combination of inputs that will work, even if you're even if you have very small amounts in the in, in your available enotes. So, like, you get you get new input. You, you request new inputs from the input selector, and then you you try to like rearrange the, your your the inputs you've selected so far to find a combination that will satisfy the output amount plus the fee, and the fee is dynamically dynamically calculated based on how many inputs you've selected. Uh, so that it's just like, that's what this algorithm is doing. But the input selector is an interface that wraps whatever you want it to wrap. You can have input selection, input selector mocks. In the, in the output store, so this is a real mess. This is the mockup for input selection. Um, it's basically, I think it's a friend friend class on the enote store right now, and it just iterates through the the stored enotes to find to find ones that uh, the current code has some like um, it has some bias. It introduces some like additional uh like factors into the decision of what it yeah. selects um based off of like relations to other inputs like you don't want to spend two inputs that are like close in blocks things like that um yeah so the input selector i sent i sent i send in the already added inputs and already excluded inputs so that you can kind of do an analysis to decide which 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 input to uh, select next? I, uh, because I knew I know that uh, the current algorithm uses that context. So that's yeah. that's what my strategy was here. But I don't know if it'll actually. It could probably be you, uh, be reworked if uh, there is needed. A lot of that stuff is also not as important with like binning, for example, or with. Uh... And when you get like really large ring sizes, probably is, becomes less uh, less of a deal. But oh, I suppose so. Yeah, you're right. This will be a whole project for someone who isn't me. 
among all the other projects that are still in here, all the other wrapper classes. Um, I think I made a list of them, I see. Somewhere. And then, Let's do this. So here's all the here's all the mock ups I have noted down. Uh, we need the ledger context, off-chain ledger context. This one uh, probably doesn't need to be implemented right away because it's only needed for uh, um, like special use cases like uh, atomic swaps or whatever. They need to do a, a transaction chaining or whatever. They also have the eNote store. Input selector, decode selector, validation context, all the scanning stuff needs to be implemented. Those are the main ones. All right, should we close the should we close the meeting now or what do you guys think? What the hell? Um, yeah, <laughs> I have to go with you, but uh, it was pretty amazing to see if all this work. I think it will only start making sense to me when I really start using all this these things. Right now, I just did, did the uh, parallel implementation of the Gruto proofs, uh, and I'm trying to also implement your um, 